Amen. Be still. God is good. God is so good because everything that has happened today, thank you, everything that has happened today has taken me all over the place. I woke up this morning and was just, you know, trying to get ready and I took a step and my niece said, hey, <laughs> I'm here. And so I'm driving to come and I get this strong sense. I want you to sit. But God, you know, I'm an, I'm an energy guy, you know, sit. I get here, the Sabbath school lesson is about everything that this sermon is about. Hallelujah. Um, Marjorie gets up, and one of the scriptures, among others, that she mentions is in the sermon. I'm like, amen. So this shouldn't be hard for us to do. And then Paco gets up and sings, be still. Because what I've been praying is, Lord, I want people to hear your word. And I'm a loud dude, and I'm not a still dude. And so sometimes what I need to do is be still. So let me get my notes. And I'm going to do what God said and sit. And we're going to talk about an alternative narrative. Now, let's see. I just want to check something. Oh, it's on. Thank you. The, mm, the men's group here has been reading a book called Point Man. And each week we meet, folk are getting more and more excited. Last week, unfortunately, because Courtney had to be out of town, we met here and we didn't really get to Zoom much. And I heard a story from one of the brothers that said, well, hey, look, I wasn't really going to come, but, you know, I made a commitment to this thing, and so I came. There were three of us. And boy, we had a great time. As we talked, there was a story that we heard about a man who had a great grasp of scripture, great insight about how to lead folk, great ability as a businessman, and he was meeting with the pastor. And Steve Farrer happened to be the pastor. Thank you, Marjorie. Steve Farrer happened to be the pastor. And so he said, hey, you would expect that I would be meeting with this man to talk about a Bible study that he would do, or him mentoring some young people, uh, things of that nature. But I was meeting with him to challenge him about an immoral affair, no, an immoral uh, relationship, because the book talks about affair, and affair is not a fun thing, that's just a euphemism for adultery. So an immoral relationship that the man was involved in. This man was currently in a 40-year marriage, but he was dating a woman just a little older than his youngest daughter. And as Stephen Farrer challenged the man, what happened was this. The man said, well, Pastor, don't I have the right to be happy? Don't I have the right to be happy? And what sparked some questions in my mind is, where in the heck did he get that message? Where did that come from? Why was he convinced that the way he had chosen to be happy was a good thing? And then, you know, uh, how did he even think that this was right as a Christian? Well, Pastor Steen has been leading us through alternative thoughts about some very key things. 
He's talked to us over the last six weeks about an alternative foundation, an alternative knowledge, an alternative ethic, an alternative identity, <laughs> an alternative power, and last but not least, an alternative mission. And this look at these alternatives has been fresh. And I think we can use some of what he's been talking about to help us with the man that I'm going to call the unhappy Christian. But before we go there, I want to say this. I believe the unhappy Christian um, that I just told you about was operating off a narrative that most Americans wholeheartedly believe. Now the question is, is the narrative bad? And I'll answer that. But the bottom line is, what I know is that God's word presents an altogether different narrative about life's pursuits that flies in the face of the unhappy Christian's narrative. Today, we will focus on discovering God's alternative narrative. Let's pray. Great and loving God, I thank you for this opportunity, and I thank you for the people who are here. This has already been discussed in Sabbath school. It's already been uh, presented in the welcome, and it's been saying beautifully. I pray now that you will help us to enjoy the message and have fun as we talk about your alternative merit, uh, narrative. In the name of Jesus, amen. Oops. Let's go back. There we go. So where did the man get the narrative from? Well, the preamble of the Declaration of, the In of Independence says this. Oh, somebody read. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with a certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now that's not wrong. That's not bad. But what the man seemed to, the unhappy Christian seemed to interpret this as is this life that I've been living in this 40 year union has been unhappy. And I have the freedom, liberty, to go chase happiness. And you know what, I found that happiness in this vibrant young lady that I have been seeing. And so what I'm going to do is live my best life with this lady. That's problematic. It's problematic to me, is it problematic to you? Okay. So my question then becomes, what wisdom do we get from the Bible about life's pursuits? See, the preamble of the Declaration of Independence said that life's pursuits, or suggested that life's pursuits are about the pursuit of happiness. What does the Bible, what do Bible, what does Bible wisdom give us about that? Well, let's go to uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and I'm going to read it from you from the Good News translation. It's up there. After all this, there is only one thing to say. Have reverence for God and obey his commands, because this is all that we were created for. So, wait, we weren't created to chase happiness? Is that an ouch for some? You know, when I'm in, when I'm in the audience, I love to talk back to, to Pastor Lou. And sometimes he hits me with something and I have to say, ouch. Hey, this is an ouch for me, because the bottom line is I was fully possessed of the idea that I should be pursuing happiness. But what Solomon seems to be saying here is that we are to basically fear, well, reverence, and obey God because this is what we were created for. Now, let me ask you all this question, those of you who opened, to your, to your, opened your Bibles to this verse. What is the word that is used there for reverence? 
See, that's why we got to still use the Bible even though I'm doing PowerPoint. <laughs> What's the word? Fear. Fear. Now, there's a young lady. She's not here today. They call her Lena in her family. Her name is Cecil Cecilia Daigle. And we were in Sabbath school, adult Sabbath school, you all, when this 11-year-old gave this wise piece of... I see Cynthia shaking her head because one day we were holding court with this 11-year-old and I, the first thing I thought about was Jesus in the temple. So here's what this young lady said to me or said to us when we were teaching. She said, um, Mr. Grover, um, oh, I got to turn the page. Mr. Grover, um, I fear my parents not because I'm scared of them, but because I love them. And I know that they love me and they want the best for me. So fear is really about trying to honor, respect, and love my parents in the things that I do. I was like, 11? Come on. But she told us what fear is. And so our fear, we should look at God just like that. And that's what she said. She said, we should look at God just that way. Wow, that's beautiful, okay? But let's, let's ask the question, what is Solomon really trying to tell us with this? Solomon's point to us with that verse is this. Humanity's greatest pursuit in life is that of seeking a relationship with God. We do this by respecting him and obeying his commands. Okay, that's what Solomon says. Let's see. Let's check out what Moses says. Moses has two points that I want to put up there. Somebody want to read that for me? Beautiful, beautiful. I won't even speak. We'll go to the next one because he said something else. Oh, I saw it move. I felt it. I felt it buzz. Come on. There it is. All right, who will read that one for me? Okay. Uh, so Moses... Is, is, is getting to another piece of this thing. Moses is talking about, you know, our whole relationship with God is about commitment. It's about a commitment to love God. Ooh, so let's see what Moses' point is. Moses' point to us is to value your commitment to God over everything else. Ooh. Uh, I heard you, Elder Rajan. I heard you in Sabbath school. I'm sitting over there looking at Jojo, and I'm like, he just, he, he spoke Moses' point when he said, I am, comma, the way. And the bottom line is, the way is about making sure that we're committed to God with everything in us. Oh, okay. I usually don't do these kinds of sermons. I usually talk and then get to points, but I'm giving you meat now. Okay. Oh, Jesus. You know, he's the crux of all this. Jesus is the point. Okay. So now, teacher. Oh, wait a minute. Let me, let me set the scene. He had just debunked some of the arguments of the Sadducees. And so the Pharisees came on the scene. And the Pharisees were ready. They sent their best out. They sent a lawyer. And what do lawyers do? Huh? Debate. Debate. Somebody said argue. I heard a young person. I said, I like that. Um, so what do they do? They debate. They argue. Okay. So this one said, okay, we're going we're gonna to test it. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Whoop, stop. Did we just see that? Who said that? Moses. So now we got Jesus going back to the wisdom of old and pulling something out. Okay? This is what we're doing. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Oh, here's what I say about Jesus before we talk about what his point was. Jesus made commandments sound like commitments. Ouch. I'll say it myself. Ouch. What do I mean by that? And we got a little time to talk, so let's do that. What do I mean by Jesus made commandments sound like commitments? Come on, Bob, help me. <laughs> Clearly, they were wise enough to establish a way of life that uh, uh, proved to be fruitful in all ways. Mm. Okay. Who else? Thank you, Bob. I like that one. How, how many like that one? Uh, a commandment is coming from outside. And the problem with the outside piece is sometimes we may never connect up. But if it becomes a commitment, this is something we begin to move in and we begin to live and we begin to get scared. I mean, when I was talking to God about this sermon, when, 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 when Pastor asked me, I was like, Ooh. you want me to speak? The last time I was up here, I was not as clear as I wanted to be. But, you know, God was saying, well, maybe he prayed. <laughs> maybe he got insight. But, but why me? We got Bob, we got Nelson, we got Elder Roger. Shut up and sit. Okay? But he made it sound like, Jesus made commandments sound like commitments. And here's Jesus' point. Life's greatest pursuit is to love God and to love others with all you've got. Mm. But wait a minute, y'all. We've been told that life is the pursuit of happiness. So if life's greatest pursuit really is to love God and love others with all you got, then what are we to do with the idea of the pursuit of happiness? Now, I'm going to leave that open for a question, too. I'd like to hear from you all. Come on, Barbara. Woo! Preach, preach the sermon, Barbara. <laughs> preach the sermon. There we go. That is happiness, and we're going there. We're going there. But... The bottom line, y'all, is this. The pursuit of happiness is not a bad pursuit. It is a valuable pursuit. It is not the ultimate pursuit. And let's see. Oh, I'm not going there yet. Oops. It's not the ultimate pursuit. It is a pursuit that does not supersede our relationship with God. Come on, Barbara, I see you. Correct. Now, here's what I really loved about Pastor Luke's series. That last one, when he talked about mission, the one thing he said in mission is that, uh, I, let me just talk about Pastor, Pastor Luke for a minute. 
Um, what, what is beautiful about Pastor Luke is he's the down-to-earth dude. He's going to talk to you regular, normal, and so on and so forth. But he tells you this as well as I'm getting ready to tell you this. If you talk to him about discipleship, he goes to another level. He's in another plane. And so he was teaching the elders recently. And uh, us old cats were just sitting back there, and we were saying, okay, what's, what's this young dude going to tell us? <laughs> we know, <laughs> you know. And he said, every one of the 28 fundamental beliefs can be founded on the idea that Jesus is your friend. Now, in, it, on my face, I was smiling. Of course, we had masks on, so he couldn't see that. But in my head, I was like, okay, Doc, prove it, prove it. And he got on the board and he started taking, this is your book, this is your book. He started taking several fundamental beliefs and drilling them down to the idea that Jesus is your friend. Now, I'm not going to go through that because that's not my book. That's not my gift. That's his. But what I will say is, that it's doggone right that Jesus is our friend. And what's important for us to understand is this, that Jesus proved his friendship to us. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command. So what happens? Jesus is our friend, and he laid down his life. And all he's asking is for us to make a commitment and keep it. Ouch. Make a commitment and keep it. And what's important about that commitment? What's important is that if you're Jesus' friend, you're going to want to pursue the things Jesus would like you to pursue. And he's got for each one of us, I didn't put this scripture in, it's Philippians 1, 6. He said, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. Just let me speak on that for a minute. I operate off the narrative that everybody has a salvific gift. That's what that verse tells me. In other words, in Marjorie, he put a variety of different gifts and skills, one of them being praying. Another one, as you'll see in a minute, because she gave me the scripture for today, is just this awareness of the importance of certain pieces of scripture to minister to a heart. Okay? That's a salvific gift, Marjorie. That's a salvific gift. And you've got a couple, maybe three or four of salvific gifts. We have salvific gifts, you all, so that folk can have the opportunity to be drawn to God effectively. Okay, but I'm off topic. I'm off topic. I just talked about that. But Jesus gave himself for us, proving that he's our friend. And so, once again, we're getting back to this. The world's narrative is to pursue happiness. And it's not just an American narrative. It's a world narrative. Pursue happiness. Do, what you, do what, you, what, what you like, what you want. Okay? God's alternative narrative is to seek him. Period. That's what's going on. So I know the question has to be, to me, um, so what do we do with the, the idea of happiness. Well, the first thing I think we ought to do, oh, I messed up. That's all right, it's there. This is a scripture, I'll just tell the story. Last week, I was in a bad, the week before last, I was in a bad state with regard to the lesson. And I, you know, I, we've been calling our students, you know, and we haven't had much response with the calls. But I started texting a few of the ones on my list, and Marjorie has been one that has always responded. And so she responded to me the week before last in a way. I was like, okay, yeah, I like that. So let me hit her up early this week and tell her what I'm struggling with. 
the very next day, no, actually this time it was the very day, she sent me this scripture. She asked me to read the whole thing, but I'm only going to read this part. You heard Sister Carissa read it in the, in, uh, the New King James Version. Listen to the way it, it sounds in the Message Bible. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way to salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the, okay, let me make sure I get to it. Okay, good, I got it there. This is the way God works, and most powerfully, as it turns out, it's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as crackpots. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in the days, in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world, in all its fancy wisdom, never had a clue when it came to knowing God, that's an important verse. I'll read it again. Since the world in all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God and his wisdom took delight in using what the world considered dumb, preaching of all things to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Grover, that's a lot of stuff. What in the heck is that saying? Why should we privilege God's alternative narrative over all others? Well, there are reasons to embrace it, and there are reasons to, uh, well, I'll go there when I go there. There are reasons to embrace it, and there are three. God's alternative narrative, based on this verse, calls us to believe in the power of Jesus' sacrifice. God's alternative narrative urges us to truly know and trust God. And God's alternative narrative points the way to salvation. So we can talk about the pursuit of happiness all we want, but if we really want to have salvation, then we need to trust and know God. And if we really talk about trust and knowing God, we've got to know the entity who sent his son to earth to engage us, to show us how to live, and then, boom, to die and sacrifice his life for us, and then rise again. I don't ever like talking about the death without talking about the resurrection, because that's key. So why should we embrace these three reasons? Why should we privilege it? Those three reasons. Uh-oh, but here's, a, here's what Marjorie did to me again. So Marjorie gets up for the welcome, and I'm like, okay, so should Christians be happy then? If we're saying that we can't embrace this pursuit of happiness narrative, should Christians be happy? Well, here's a reason to rejoice. Marjorie said in Galatians 5, 22, 23, and this is also from the Message Bible. Let's see how he writes this. I love the way he does that. Now, we can't always use it, but we're going to use it here. But what happens when we live God's way? Uh-oh. He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others. There was that love that Marjorie was talking about. Uh, exuberance about life. There's that joy. Serenity. Peace. We develop a willingness to stick with things. A sense of compassion in the heart. And a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments. Commandments. Commandments 